you mate looking at her why are you dancing like that you taking the piss so me and another pal of ours I won't mention his name uh, said to this guy look just put one of them in your mouth and in an hour's time right just trust us in an hour's time you'll enjoy yourself and there'll be no fighting and you'll be dancing like us he, he ends up scrounging like about 30 pills for all his squaddy mates so two hours later we've got all these squaddies in this thing doing this you know and dancing and going saying this is the best thing i don't want to go back in the army and all that lot so there we are in driffled and i drove over there but in between that and finding all these squaddies looking for the Mondays in the local pub, I finally find the studio in this courtyard and go in the recording room and there's Martin Hannett recording a wonderful rock track, God knows which one. And then I go across the courtyard to what is normally where, where musicians play pool and hang out and drink coffee and get bored. And all I could hear was <coughs> coming out of this space and there was no lights on. I remember opening the door and it was pitch dark and stumbling over bodies and lots and lots of black vinyl. And across the way, they were recording this rock album, but in this room, they were all lying on the floor, out of their heads, just playing this, this weird, obscure, American imported house music. To put a house beat into their indie rock, the Mondays brought a DJ into the studio. Rope for Luck was, was just the way I approach that mix is what works on the dance floor. None of us really knew how it was going to turn out. I knew what I wanted. I knew that the rhythms in rock records never worked. So it had to be more rhythmic, especially the bottom end. Um, so it was all about changing the B line and the drums. So basically we took a loop from NWA, looped it up, got Ryder's vocals up and, and worked on a groove and it went from there. Well, what he brought to it, right, was he brought that sort of trance to it. You know what I mean? Where you know you you, you couldn't you didn't have to well the boom you know you could give it all all that and things you know what I mean and and even do cartwheels and things you know and things like that. He brought that smooth mellowness, everything to it, that all the right ingredients. When you've got the trust that that Sean and the boys gave us. And the vision that we had, it, it, it just it just worked. It wasn't something you sat down and tried to work out why it worked. There was a vibe, and the vibe was a good vibe. And plus, we didn't have a clue. You know, if you'd have shown me a mixing desk, then, you know, I'd, I'd have thought you cut sheet metal on it. Think about the The Mondays led an explosion in indie dance music and took house to a whole new audience. Think about the future, the future. Well, I'm quoting the Daily Telegraph here. The drummer and bass player of the Mondays changed British music by adapting the house rhythms of Chicago to British rock, punk, indie or whatever. They were the synthesizers. They were the people who inadvertently put all this shit together. House had shaken up pop and rejuvenated rock, but its impact on British culture wasn't just musical. You probably had black friends and I had white friends, but you wouldn't party together. You would not party together. It just wasn't that way. After work, you went your way, I went my way. Do you know what I mean? That's how it, that's how it was in the 80s, like it or not, it was. But what the rave scene did, it put everybody together. After work, they came together. As the 80s ended, the country found itself dancing to the same drum. 
we started to experience going out to raves and seeing all different cultures under one roof. Because in our vibe, when we was growing up doing our thing, it wasn't like that, as he said. Mm. It was just a black thing or a white thing. So we were going out and seeing this culture of things mixing up. And we was a part of that. We were like, yeah, this is good. Inspired by the spirit of rave, warehouse party crew Shut Up and Dance added breakbeats to the emerging British sound. If you went to a rave back then, as you probably did yourself, taking ease, naughty man. <laughs> um, no comment, though. <laughs> you would notice that everything was drum machines. It was everything was dump, dump, just straight four beats. But when we was making music, it was using break beats. Drum breaks had been the rhythmic base of hip hop for years. We took the break beats out of the hip hop culture and put it into our music, but we sped it up to a house tempo. <laughs> By strapping an up-tempo break onto a basic house rhythm, Shut Up and Dance took the music another step away from the clubs of Chicago and New York. We used to put on our rate, our warehouse raves, you know, but we was only charging like two pounds, three pounds to get in. And then when the so-called house scene started to blow up, the rave scene, all of a sudden it was ten pounds to get in. Do you know, we was like, no, 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 taking a piss here. We was charging two pounds to get in in our place. We was at one time. We was like, there's no way I'm paying this to go anywhere. Yeah. I mean, we were charging like two pound, three pound at our gates, and people were screwing to pay that. So when people, we heard people are paying £10, we were like, bloody hell, that's amazing. Like, where are these people getting the money from? And like, these promoters are taking a piss. So that's sort of where the, the idea from the tune came from. Shut Up and Dance fueled the growing rave scene and laid the foundations for both Jungle and UK Garage. After we came up, a lot of people were trying to copy us, trying to copy our sound. But we were getting mentioned in the same breath of that hardcore sound. But we always never saw ourselves as that, and we always distanced ourselves from that. But again, it's like one of them ones where we thought it was a rap man, but we weren't, so what do I know? <laughs> as House entered the 90s, it continued to stir up new musical styles. That the hardcore scene started off as jungle first, and then it then it was then it was kind of jungle techno, and then it went from jungle techno to, to hardcore, and then from hardcore to happy hardcore, and then from happy hardcore to kind of like the SL2 sound, which was like jungle and happy hardcore and everything thrown into <laughs> thrown into the pot together, which became commercial. The English have to have a name for every goddamn thing, you know. It's ridiculous, man. It's just got to be something. And it's always got to have some sort of marketability behind it. And it's, I know it's a business, but God, Lee, I mean, here we are still trying to retitle and rehash old music uh, with new titles and new, uh, new genres and all this kind of shit. I mean, what is it now? Uh, I don't even know what it is anymore. It's, it's always something new, some stupid-ass name for music. Whatever names you called it, it wasn't going away. Two years after it mushroomed in the English countryside, the rave scene had grown from the illegal parties of 88 into huge licensed events. No longer underground, rave was mainstream. I think there was a time when you probably couldn't buy a packet of Rizzlers outside of the M25. But by 1992-93, you could probably go to the Orkneys and buy E. You should be interviewing the drugs. <laughs> they got a lot to answer for. they got a lot to answer for, I'm telling you. You have to think, kind of, the people that made the original house records, the Detroit and Chicago DJs, most of them didn't take drugs. In fact, they were kind of, like, kind of appalled. You know, this was a technological experiment for them. You know, the th use of the 303 and stuff. Um, in England, this was a music being driven by drug taking. 